Diabetes Connections is brought to you by OneDrop, created for people with diabetes by people who have diabetes, by Real Good Foods, real food you feel good about eating, and by Dexcom. Take control of your diabetes and live life to the fullest with Dexcom. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, Melissa and Kevin Lee played an important role in what we now know as Night Scout and the DIY movement. It's kind of hard to remember, but those early days were very different. Melissa remembers what it was like the first time Kevin, her husband, followed her numbers and acknowledged what a hard day she'd had. And I didn't react. I just looked at him and he said, this is how every day is, isn't it? And like, I still get chills thinking about it, Stacey. It was the first time that anybody outside of me or another person with diabetes looked at me and said, I see you. This is hard. Melissa and Kevin were interested initially in the DIY movement because they wanted to have children. Their kids are now 10 and 8. We have a lot to talk about. In Tell Me Something Good, wedding bells for a couple who both live with type 1. And that sparked some fun stories from others in the community. Plus, an update on a change my son made after our last episode. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of Diabetes Connections. I am so glad to have you here. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. We aim to educate and inspire about type 1 diabetes by sharing stories of connection. And this is a story of connection. Melissa and Kevin have so many wonderful anecdotes to share about finding the DIY community about those early exciting days, about the projects they worked on. And we talk about what it's like as a married couple to go from not sharing any information about diabetes to being some of the first people to be able to see CGM information. You know, how does that change a relationship? How do you talk about it? And we'll get to that in just a couple of minutes. It was great to talk to them. I wanted to bring you up to speed first, though, on something that I mentioned, well, Benny mentioned it, when I spoke to him last week. So Benny is my son. If you're new, he was diagnosed right before he turned two. He is now 15 and a half. And we talked last week about changing a bit of our routine. He has been taking a long-acting insulin called Traceba for almost two years, along with using an insulin pump. It's a method called Untethered. I'm not going to rehash the whole thing. I've talked about it many times. But if you are new, I will link up more information in the show notes and, and you can go back to listen to last week or previous episodes with Benny about why we did that. Bottom line, he was using so much insulin because of puberty and maybe some other issues, genetics, who knows, that it was very, very helpful to add an additional basal source that took the pressure off the pump inset. But over the last months, his insulin use has gone way down, and that is because of three factors. He's probably coming out of puberty. He has lost a lot of weight. And we are using the Control IQ system, which we noticed right away meant we were doing far fewer big corrections, and we, he just uses so much less insulin on it. So during the show, that at the last endocrinology appointment, Dr. V had said it was fine to go off the traceba. No problem. Do it when you want, if you want. And Benny said that he did want to do that. So as I'm taping this, it's probably about eight days since we made the switch. It takes about two, th three days. Everybody's a little different to get traceba out of your system. It works a little differently than some other long acting. So it, it takes longer to get out of your system. We did have a rocky three days, but we were used to that. We knew that was coming. and. Just as I had hoped, Control IQ, the software system with the tandem pump and the Dexcom, just has worked even better than it did before. And I don't talk about specific numbers with my son. That's not how I roll. But just to give you some perspective, he has been about 70% in range. You know, it goes up, it goes down. I'm very happy with that number. He has been 80% in range, I think 82% in range for the last seven days as an average and two days where he was like 98% in range. It's crazy. So I don't think that'll continue because that's not how diabetes works, right? Don't you find sometimes it like lulls you when you make a switch? It, it always starts out great. And then like a week or two later, the floor, like the rug just is pulled out from under you. So we'll see. I want to get to Melissa and Kevin, but at the end of the show, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, some changes we've made recently. In addition to Traceba, we have changed how we use sleep mode. So stay tuned. At the very end, I'm going to talk about that. But I know not everybody uses Control IQ, so stand by. Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Real Good Foods. It's really easy to compare and see what we love about Real Good Foods. If you put them side by side to other products, I mean, their breakfast sandwiches, 
six grams of carbs, 18 grams of protein compared to like, you know, 26, 36 grams of carbs in other products and a lot less protein and a lot more junk. If you look at their cauliflower crust pizza, you know, what's amazing. Not every cauliflower crust pizza is actually low in carb. You, you know, you know this, you got to read the labels. So real good foods, nine grams of carbs in their cauliflower crust pizza. Some of the other ones have you know, 35, 40 grams of carbs. And not everybody eats low carb, but, you know, you want to know what you're getting. You want to really be able to see, well, if I'm eating a cauliflower crust pizza, you might as well eat, you know, a bread crust if you want 40 carbs per serving. Real good foods is just that. They are made with real ingredients, you know, stuff you can pronounce. It's so easy to find. They have that locator on their website. It's in our grocery store. It's in our Walmart. And you can order everything online. Find out more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Real Good Foods logo. My guests this week are part of the history of the diabetes DIY movement. Longtime listeners know that I am fascinated by the We Are Not Waiting crowd. And I can't say enough about what they have done for our community. In fact, I'm actually trying to put together an oral history. Um, We've talked to a lot of people since 2015 when I started the show about this movement. Uh, The big problem is a lot of these wonderful engineering and tech types are a little spotlight adverse. You know who you are, but I'll, I'll get there. I did reach out to Kevin and Melissa because, you know, while I've talked to Melissa a few times about pregnancy and type one and other issues, I think that the show we did as a panel with other guests about pregnancy and type one and steel magnolias is frankly one of the top 10 episodes, not because of me, but the guests were were so amazing and and I get so much praise on that episode. People, you know, women pass it around. I'll link that up in, in the show notes. But, you know, I hadn't heard Melissa and Kevin's story. And their names always come up when we hear about the early days of the DIY builders. So our talk today is about much more than the technology. It's also about marriage and kids and diabetes and sharing data, you know, how that affects relationships. Quick note, Kevin now works for Bigfoot Biomedical and Melissa works for Tidepool. If those names don't mean anything to you, if you don't know what those are or, you know, what they do, it might be a little bit of a confusing interview. There's some presumed knowledge here. I will put some links in the show notes. You may want to go back and listen to previous episodes about the We Are Not Waiting movement or just check out the links. Also, it is really hard to get people to acknowledge the difference they've made. These are all very modest people. God love them. But I do try. So here's my interview with Kevin and Melissa Lee. Melissa and Kevin, I am so excited to talk to you two together. Thanks for making time to do this. I know how busy you both are. Thank you for having us on. This is a fun thing to get to do. I don't know if Kevin's going to think it's that fun. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. And I say that because in the small way that I know you, you don't seem like you're quite as conversational and chit-chatty as, as me and Melissa, but we'll we'll see how it goes. Kevin, thanks for joining us and putting up with me already. <laughs> well, you know, he actually is until you stick a microphone in front of his face. Oh, so, okay. Like, uh, you know, beyond that, yeah. Well, let's start when when you guys started. And Melissa, I will ask you first, how did you meet? Oh, (laughs) this is a story I love to tell. And Kevin's going to already be like, why did I agree to do this? So this was like 2006. And I'd spent a couple of years doing internet dating. And, you know, I'm very extroverted and and like a go-getter. And I had just been on like 40 bad dates, basically, on the internet. Basically, I was broke from spending money on lots of different dating sites. And I found a free one. So I joined that one. And it turns out that this guy was on it because one, it was free. And two, he liked their matching algorithm. (laughs) That tells you a little bit about what you need to know. So we met online. And then what, a year and a half later, uh, we were married. Wow. So yeah, we were married in late 2007. At the time, I was a music teacher. And Kevin, how would you describe what you did in the world? (laughs) I was working at uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, just deploying web applications as a contractor at uh, IBM. And then in our early years, you worked for Capital One Bank doing infrastructure architecture, and then later for American Airlines doing their infrastructure Mm -hmm. architecture. So he likes to say, you know, he's been in finance, he's been in travel, he's been in transport, he's been in lots of different fields doing that same thing that I just said, infrastructure architecture, which I will not explain. <laughs> so, Kevin, when did you go from checking out the algorithm of the dating app to noticing that perhaps the diabetes technology that your 
girlfriend and fiance then wife was using? When did you notice that it really could be done better and that you could do it? That came a little bit uh, later. I mean, at, at first, I, I kind of just let her her do her own thing. She managed it. She managed it uh, well. And then as we started to progress and we both wanted kids. Yeah, so we got back from the honeymoon and I had babies on the brain and two of my bridesmaids were pregnant. And then I had this whole, you know, in our pregnancy podcast that we did together, I had babies on the brain, but I had this diabetes hanging over me. And I think that that was a huge motivator for both of us. So like yeah. mid 2008, my insulin pump was out of warranty and... Uh, so that's that's whenever I really started to encourage her, and I started getting involved and saying, "Hey, let's let's go experiment. Let's find what's what's right. Let's look at uh, what else, what other options exist." And I didn't find too many other options, but no, uh, we I did switch. I switched insulin pump brands, and we started talking about this new thing that was going to be coming to market called the CGM. Hmm. So I got my first CGM within the next year. And Kevin immediately started trying to figure out how it worked. So this was the Freestyle Navigator. And this was like 2009. I think I was maybe already pregnant or about to be pregnant. And Kevin was trying to hack this device. So what does that mean when you said you tried to figure it out? What did you do? Well, it bugged me that the uh, acceptable solution was that we, we had this little device that had a range of in, measured in the tens of feet. That was it. And I had a, a commute at the time I was working at a American Airlines and my commute was uh, 45 miles one day uh, daily and she was pregnant. And I just wanted some sort of assurance that she was safe and there was no way to get that. And I just wanted to, to be able, you know, it, it was obvious that this sensor was sending the data that I wanted uh, on the uh, available through uh, an internet connection. How do I get that? Ultimately, that uh, effort was unsuccessful. And that's when we started going to uh, Friends for Life. And there, that's where we saw, uh, I guess, uh, Damiano's connected uh, solution where it was remote monitoring and we saw the, the Dexcom. And that's whenever I thought, hey, if that's an option. And so we started looking uh, into the Dexcom and switched over. I'm going to jump in because I'm a little confused. When you said you said Damiano's connected setup, I thought that he was showing off what is now called the eyelet and the, you know, the bio hormonal insulin pump. What was the Dexcom component to that that you hadn't seen before? So it was just a simple remote monitoring. You know, he needed to be able to, as part of his research, to, to be able to remotely monitor the, the patients that were... Well, Specifically, he had an early version of the bionic pancreas had a Dexcom that was cabled to a phone. Mm -hmm. Oh. And so if you look back at like 2012 yes, development. Yes, I remember this. Was doing, you remember? Yes. And so like he, I remember Kevin holding the setup in his hand and looking at it and being like, you know, this is fascinating. Like, I have an idea. Because mm. at the time, and, I, and I'll find a picture of it, but it was cabled to a phone and there were at least two insets from the pump. So you had to have the, the CGM inset, and then you had to have two pump insets, and then the phone cable for the bionic pancreas at that time. Am I thinking of the right picture? No, I'm, I'm not really sure. Oh. I want to <laughs> see all of that. That's yeah, right. you know, like, we're so old at this point, I right? Know, like, our memory is fuzzy. Because like, um, it's like eight years ago or now, yeah, uh, yeah. which I'm realizing because how old my children are. Um, right. But this is, you know, I want to say that this is even before – We'd have to go back and back to that. Yeah, and that was just the moment that said, "Hey, okay, this is another uh, alternative." And we were we were actually looking to to switch at the time because I, I think that's when the the now it already switched. Okay, we had to switch because the navigator went off the market in 2011. So this is right around the time we just switched to Dexcom. So what did you do with the Dexcom, Kevin? Whenever we noticed that there was a, a little port that was also used for for charging and for data, I connected up to it and started reverse engineering it, sending data and seeing what we got back and trying to get that data off. It was first connected to my little Mac, uh, MacBook Pro, and I just had a goal over Thanksgiving to be able to get that data out uh, of the, the CGM, and it took 
three or four days, and I was able to get uh, basic data out of the system. And from there, it was just as simple as uh, uploading it and then visualizing it. So for perspective, and I want to be careful here because I know there are a lot of people working on a lot of different things. I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not looking for who was first or when did that happen exactly. But just for perspective, is this basically the same thing that we then saw like John Costick put up on Twitter when he said he got it like on the laptop or like what would we have seen if we had been sitting in your house that day? Right back to Kevin and Melissa. But first, you know, it is so nice to find a diabetes product that not only does what you need, but also fits in perfectly with your life. One drop is just that. It is the sleekest looking and most modern meter my family has ever used. And it's not just about their modern meter setup. You can also send your readings to the mobile app automatically and review your data anytime. Instantly share blood glucose reports with your healthcare team. It also works with your Dexcom, Fitbit, or your Apple Watch. And not to mention, they have that awesome test strip subscription plan. Take as many test strips as you need, and they'll deliver them to your door. One drop, diabetes care delivered. Learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the One Drop logo. Now back to Kevin answering my question about you know, what did it look like when he figured out how to reverse engineer and free the Dexcom data? Uh, absolutely. That we would, you would have seen a little text flying by saying this is the, the glucose number. On and, the computer. Yeah, on the, the, oh. on the computer. It wouldn't have been very exciting to most. <laughs> and from there, Melissa tweeted out saying, hey, we, we have the, the data available from our Mac. And I guess that's where uh, Joyce Lee uh, picked up on it and wanted some more information. All right. So, Melissa, take it from there. Yeah, you know, Joyce has been a real champion of those early DIY days. And so I remember her reaching out to me and saying, this is this is really interesting. I want to know more. And, and this was the same year that Dana and Scott had, were bringing their thing to life with what was then DIYPS. This is around the same time, um, same era in history that um, that John Kostick was doing his great stuff in, and with Lane Desborough in the early days of Night Scout. So all of these things were happening in these little pockets, and we were just another little pocket. At the time, one of the things that concerned us was whether we were doing something that was going to be shut down really quickly. Like, there's something that you sign knowingly or unknowingly. It's kind of like when you agree to the terms on oh, iTunes or whatever. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you use these devices, there's something called an EULA, an End User License Agreement. And these EULAs say you're not going to reverse engineer this product. And so we were a little cautious about what we wanted to disseminate um, in terms of like, here, take this and run with it. But that culture was still developing. And so at the end of that year was the big D data event at the Diabetes Mind Summit, where there were a few really key DIY influencers sort of in the room this is where Lane first coined the we are not waiting. And, this, uh. and the next day I was at that summit and I was hearing Howard Look speak about what had happened at the D-Data Summit the day before. And I was like, oh, my God, Kevin has to plug into this. Like he, We want to help this initiative. Like We want to be a part of this. We have so much to offer. We have this whole remote monitoring setup that he had built for me. And at the time, like by then, I think one of the biggest things we had done is Kevin had developed, um, do you want to talk about Glass? Yeah, it was just a, another way to visualize the, the data. So Google Glass, I don't know if you remember that. It was a, uh, kind of a, a connected. <laughs> yeah, in some ways it was ahead of its time. In other ways, it was just a really uh, interesting idea. <laughs> Diplomatically said. I got a pair and uh, I was able to have it alert me when she crossed a simple threshold uh -huh. and I was able to see historically, uh, you know, three hours or, or 12 hours or whatever it was without having to, to pull up a web page. It was just kind of always there and, and on and available for me uh, if and when I needed it. So it was just kind of an ambient thing in the background that I didn't feel like I, I had to, to worry about. Isn't that interesting. Kevin, I, I'm curious in those early days though, if I could just jump in. Uh -huh. You know, you, you don't have type 1. You care very much about someone with type 1, and you're doing this because you care about her and want to make sure she's safe. When you started meeting other people who were doing the same thing, 
What was that like for you? I know it's chancy to ask an engineer about how they feel, but it had to have been nice to get some kinship with these other people who basically spoke your language and also understood the importance behind what was going on. Yeah, so that was actually really kind of interesting. Whenever we first started sharing it, we wanted to share it just with a a small uh, group of of people. And um, I think it was Manny Hernandez that introduced me directly to uh, Lane and Howard and uh, a few others, Brian (laughs) uh, Maslisch. So, yeah, so I I like to tell the story that I I chased Howard looked down in the hallway after that and was like, you have to connect with my husband. And then that didn't seem to work. So that's when Manny was like, Manny Hernandez, who uh, was the uh, founder of Diabetes Hands Foundation, he um, is a good friend of ours. And he was like, no, I I have to connect you to these guys. Um, And so there's this pivotal email thread from January of 2014. So where we we start exchanging the, uh, well, here's the project that I've done. And Lane says, well, here's a project that, that we've been working on and we call it night scout. And so we, we kind of exchanged notes and then it was a little bit later that, uh, um, Lane, uh, well, maybe not Lane exactly, but that's when the, the, the whole CGM and the, the, the cloud and, uh, the, uh, night scout, uh, early foundations started to show up on, on Facebook. I think that's whenever, uh, the, the, Another engineer had uh, published the uh, code uh, on on GitHub and started to set up. Here's here's how you set it up. Wow. There weren't many in my situation. You know, one of the engineers was uh, a parent, uh, and I think we actually made a really great mix. And I think that that's part of what made this successful. So, uh, one of the engineers working on the project was the uh, father uh, of a, a Type One. I represented the the spouse and uh, some of the other uh, engineers were personally affected by by type one and definitely added a, a different level increased the the, the camaraderie uh, between us you know those are early days we were we were on the phone almost nightly as soon as I'd get off my my day job I'd go home and, and work on the the evening job of trying to get the next set of features out or to fix you know add some some new fixes. I love to describe those days because throughout 2014, he would walk in the door and he was already on the phone (laughs) with the other devs from Night Scout. And if I walked in the room where he was working on the computer, I would be like, hey, Kevin. And then I'd be like, hey, Ross. Hey, Jason. Because I just assumed they were on the phone. Hey, Ben. Um, And so, like, it was staying up all night long. They didn't sleep. They just did this all day long. Kevin, talk a little bit about the pieces you brought in to Night Scout from mm-hmm. our system that we had created. And then we, like, I, I'll, I, you know, I was just producing diabetes data. I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to claim a lot of that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was just plugged into it. If people are familiar today with Night Scout, which many listeners may be, like, what piece did they hold in their hands that was yours? Mm-hmm. Hmm. So the, the piece that I was so connected with was the, uh, what we refer to as the uploader. It was just the piece that extracted the data from the CGM and then uploaded it to the Night Scout website. Uh, early days, I don't know if you remember, it was the little 3D printed case with a, a phone that you, you got that happened to have a data plan and a wire connected to the, yeah. the, the CGM. Right whenever Night Scout first came out, I was, I was hesitant to, to start. I mean, this was like the first few months. I was hesitant to contribute. I wanted to see what I could do. But as it started to pick up be there, it was obvious that um, the, the pace of development that I was doing on my own was not going to equal what the, the rest of the community could be doing. But then again, I, I had these other features, which I, I'll go into in a moment here, that I felt the community could benefit from. So we started having early conversations with Ben and others. Well, how do we fold in functionality that I had into the current uploader? And that functionality was essentially this early ability to follow on a native phone app. It was decreasing the size of the, the packet and uploading uh, more, so using uh, less data. It was uh, an Android watch, being able to get the latest data on an Android watch. It was used 
in uh, camping mode. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but the whenever the early days of Night Scout, we had the pebbles that mm-hmm. were uh, kind of Bluetooth connected smartwatch uh, that used the little e-ink displays. Those required you to be connected to the internet. And one of the devs, uh, Jason Calabrese, had said, I'm going camping next week and I'm not going to have internet connectivity. And I sure wish that, that I, I could. So I, I thought about it for a minute and we were able to quickly uh, reconfigure it, the, the existing code, to be able to get that data on the, the watch without an internet connection. So camping mode literally came from a camping trip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I never came knew from that. Jason Calabrese's camping trip. <laughs> So. Well, and then the code that became XDRIP, which like thousands of people use today. So that, that's a great thing about the uh, open source community. Whenever ideas reverberate off of each other and uh, become more pronounced and, and it essentially becomes the sum is greater than whole. It, Let me ask you about XDRIP, though. Wasn't XDRIP originally called DexDRIP? Was that one of the first times Dexcom got involved and said no thank you? Or did I misremember that? That was all part of Emma Black's history. So Emma took the code that Kevin had created and uh, and created what was and built on Dextrip, top of that. Built on top of that to create Dextrip. And Dexcom did say you can't use our name in this, <laughs> and it became Dextrip. Yeah, that you're remembering correctly. Yeah, it was a very friendly discussion, and so it was renamed to Dextrip. Uh, but you bring up an important point about how industry was reacting to all of this. In late 2014, the team at Medtronic actually invited many of the community members who were working on this into sort of the belly of the beast and to come in and talk to them about the why and and the challenges and the what could industry do and and what are we not hearing and just sort of like a, a meeting of the minds. But what was so cool about this is this is the first time that many of us had met one another in person. Mm-hmm. So here people had been working on this for a year or two. And now suddenly it's a table with Dana Lewis and Scott Librand, with John Kostick, with Ben West, with me, with Kevin, with Jason Calabrese. Like we're, we're sitting around a table for the first time and talking with industry as this united community. So it felt a little less, to me at least, as someone who's been really involved in fostering community, right? Uh, It felt to me like there is the start of something here. And that was a really exciting meeting. We we like to joke that nothing came of it. I was going to ask about that. Oh, no. Um, But to me, like, that was exciting. It was this energy of, like, we all came to the table and said, like, these are the needs of the community. This is why we need remote monitoring. And this is what we're going to do next. And you can either help us or understand we'll do it anyway. And so that was that we are not waiting spirit. Well, and that was a very pivotal time. And Melissa, let me just continue with that thought if I could. It was such a pivotal time because you all could have said, we are not going to continue without you, right? We need this. But it seemed to me, and again, it's hard for me, you know, it's funny that it's so long ago now, but it's only four or five, it's only it's only five or six years ago, really. The seeds of that community, and you can see it just in the Facebook group with CGM in the cloud and everything else. There's tens of thousands of people now who are part of this community. You know, did you, you saw the seeds of it then. Did you ever imagine it was going to get as big as it is now? Is it crazy to say yes? <laughs> I think Kevin and I are looking at each other like. To directly answer the question, Yes. And that's where we were actually faced with a, another really tough decision of how do we continue to solve these problems? And, and we started to see the scalability problem that what we viewed as a scalability problem within the, the community. You know, how do we continue to support it and how do we deliver this safely to masses? It was a, a choice that we had to make of if we join the, the industry and we, we try to do it uh, this way. I don't know. There, there isn't really one right or, or wrong way to do it, but it was just another way. And we believed that by joining industry that we could deliver something simple, easy, and we could make it scalable and supportable for the masses. Well, I was just going to say, I think those things like those meetings with Medtronic or 
or Dexcom early on. Um, I mean, I remember sitting in Kevin Sayer's office at Dexcom, and I was there for uh, a completely other reason. I was there on behalf of Diabetes Pants Foundation, and I just, like, went off about night now <laughs> for <laughs> Kevin Sayer. But those conversations gave us a a really, like, and I want to recognize our privilege in that, to be able to be in a position to, to go sit with leadership at these big uh, diabetes device companies. But it let us see that there was a way to bring the change we were doing outside, I, I don't want to use the different word infiltrate because that sounds so nefarious, <laughs> but like, but to infuse what industry was trying to do with community perspective and patient perspective and, and the change that we knew was possible. And that resulted in both of us for huge career changes. And we will get to that for sure. Because it's fascinating when you mentioned and, you know, we're doing a lot of name dropping here. And if you're if you're new to this and you've listened this far, I promise I will be putting a lot of notes on the episode homepage and you can go back and listen to other episodes. But there's a lot of names that have gone by and a lot of names that you mentioned are people who either founded or were instrumental in the founding of newer independent companies that came out of, at least as I see it, this DIY wave that happened in the mid 2010s that you all are talking about. And now you both, you know, you work with these companies and for these companies. But I want to continue this, the scalability, as you mentioned, because it's remarkable that even as all those companies, I mean, Bigfoot, uh, Tidepool, you know, even as these companies came out of this, you're still servicing all these, and I'll call us lay people. I mean, I, you know, most of the people who were early adopters of Night Scout or things like that seem to have some kind of engineering background or something that helped software make sense. But then the floodgates opened and it was just easy for people or easier than it seemed for people to do that. Kevin, was there a point that you kind of remember looking at this and thinking, you don't have to be an engineer? That's actually part of the reason why I continued to contribute with Night Scout. I mean, that's the uh... You know, the uh, early days, we, we decided we were going to go ahead and launch on the, the Play Store. So we set up uh, an account and, you know, instead of having to, to go out, download the source code, compile it, we distributed it via the channel that users were used to receiving their, their apps from. Another thing that we introduced was the uh, barcode scanning. So what we found out was setup of the app was a little more complex than it needed to be. And so we introduced the, uh, the the concept of barcode scanning to set that up. Right. Uh, Which now exists in the commercial. Like every time you start a new transmitter on a Dexcom system today, you scan a barcode on the side of the box. Wow. Kevin did that. I remember. I am not claiming that Dexcom did not develop that on their own. I am just claiming, hey, we, um, <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's wild. I didn't. Yeah, I was thinking about that because now that's, of course, that's how we do it. And Melissa, I, I know I'm kind of jumping around here, but I have so many questions. I, I, I wanted to ask you earlier, what was it like for you at this time? You said, well, I just provided the data. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what was it like for you during this time other than, you know, just popping in and saying, hey, honey, how are the phone calls going? It had to have been exciting and a little nerve wracking for you. What was it like? By my count, and again, not that it matters, I think I was the first spouse to be followed. Um, <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds creepy, doesn't it? Um, I was the first CGM stalked for uh, spouse. And I'm, no, um, but one of the things, like, it did a few things for me. Um, I'll never forget one day. I was in the kitchen, you know, I've got babies and, and toddler and, and like, like, it had just been a day, right? When you're a young mom and you've got uh, little ones, and it had just been a day. And, and Kevin walks in and he said, um, you've had a really hard day. And I just looked at him like, are you an idiot? Yes, I've had a hard day. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, your numbers. Oh. And I just looked at him and I didn't react. I just looked at him and he said, this is how every day is, isn't it? And like, I still get chills thinking about it, Stacey. I like, it was the first time that anybody outside of me or another person with diabetes looked at me and said, I see you. This is hard. And I didn't even know how to respond. I mean, I like I probably said, yes, you idiot. I've had a hard day. <laughs> <laughs> I but, doubt it. <clears throat> you know, 
I had worked on some some code to make Night Scout available via personal assistance. And I think the uh, Alexa and, and Google Home and and other uh, other things. And uh, while I was uh, experimenting and uh, testing it, uh, it became very clear that I <laughs> I was not allowed to ask what well, those values. So here, were. yeah, here's the thing. Uh, he was like, "Oh, it'll be so handy, you know, if you're in the middle of cooking and you've got like you know stuff on your hands, you can just ask it." But like, what you don't do is, you know, your wife snaps at you and you say, Alexa, what's her blood sugar right now? Like, wow. that is not what you do. <laughs> um, so, no, the story I was going to tell, oh, Stacey, you're going to love this one. So this is like early 2015, and I am the interim executive of a nonprofit, and I'm representing patients at this uh, endocrinologist ACE meeting. And I'm alone in a hotel and I had been out with all these endocrinologists and we'd had tacos at a bar and I have no idea what my glucose was, but I had calibrated my CGM with probably tacos all over my hands <laughs> and I go to bed. Well, this poor man, I'm in Nashville. He's in Dallas. This poor man is getting uh, <laughs> <laughs> with the, the Her blood sugar was reading is 39, yes. which for those who don't know, <laughs> is the lowest that the CGM can read. Anything so below that he, is still registered as low. I had my phone on silent because I'd been out with all these professionals. So he had called me 18 times. It didn't go through. I was on Do Not Disturb. So um, coming up on two hours of it reading at like a 39. So <laughs> hotel security bursts into my room. Mrs. Lee, Mrs. Lee, are you okay? Do we need to call an ambulance? The string of expletives that came out of my mouth, I will not repeat on this good family show, but I was so mad. And, you know, I'm calling him and I'm like, I'm, I'm like 130 right now. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> By that same token, I have lots of like really lovely stories where, you know, I'm alone in a hotel in New Jersey and he wakes me up in the middle of the night to say, you know, wake up and eat something, honey. So, yeah, there are the good stories, too. But I much prefer the story where he had security break into my room. Oh, my gosh. Over over what night that was. Doing. So, you know, to, but to your question, we really were on the very bleeding edge of understanding things that you actually already deal with with your son today and that people deal with today in terms of how will we actually establish boundaries on exactly. how much of my data you get to react to. And for all the times that it is a benefit, where are the times where it's like, no, I, I, I actually have to cut you off. We are now uh, like seven years into him following my data. And so in some ways, I think we both see where people will get to when following data is the norm, you know, should it ever scale that wide in terms of now he doesn't look at my data all the time. Now he knows when to respond when it warrants hotel security or not. He's probably still how to do it. Yeah. But it made me feel understood. And it also made me feel a lot safer to know that just have somebody else watching my own back. I'll be celebrating 30 years with type one this year and celebrating uh, is, you know, used in a, <laughs> in a very <laughs> special way there. But like to know that like somebody else is just there to pick up a little bit of slack, you know, for someone like where you are, it can be hard because I know, well, you know, teens don't always appreciate uh, <laughs> or show their appreciation in the same way. But there is an appreciation for the fact that, that you're there to pick up a little bit of slack, just as much as there is resentment and issues with boundaries and, um, and times when they really need to just shut your access off. And so I feel like we're just a little bit further down on that road in some ways. You know, we'll let you know when we have it all figured out. But exactly. I, you know, and, <laughs> and, and what's right for us as a couple is not necessarily going to be right for every couple. You know, there are couples that really feel like, no, my data is mine and I don't trust you not to react to it in a way that's going to make diabetes any harder for me. And I think that that's what we 100% have that I'm very fortunate to have is that I trust Kevin to react to my data the way that I'm comfortable with him reacting to my data. So both of you through this process wound up not only having two kids, but you made big job changes and you now both work in the diabetes sphere. 
And I, I hope you don't mind. I'd really like to talk about that a little bit because, I mean, you mentioned at the beginning, Liz, that you were a music teacher. And you're right, yeah. your background, you're a music professional. You were at Bigfoot for a couple of years, and now you are at Tidepool. And you're basically, I'm going to get it wrong, but you're helping Tidepool so that they can better train people and kind of explain to healthcare professionals and the public to kind of, I look at that as translating. Is that sort of what you're doing there? Yes and no. So, for instance, I know your family has just started with a new piece of diabetes technology. There were certain training modules that were there to support you. There's certain learning materials that were provided to your child's doctor so that they understood what they were prescribing. There's a user guide that comes with the stuff that you use in your family today if you're buying things from companies off the shelf. And what the DIY community, when we're talking about scalability and how important that is to each of us, Kevin and me, accessibility, accessibility, uh, scalability, availability, like these important, how do we bring this to people in a way that they will actually be able to access it? Tidepool announced about a year ago that they were going to take one of the DIY automated insulin dosing systems and actually bring it through FDA review. Part of that is it has to have the kind of onboarding and support materials that your insulin pump you buy from an insulin pump company has today. So I am leading the development of all of those materials for both the clinics and the doctors, as well as for the end user to learn the system. And Kevin, you're still at Bigfoot, so you're a principal engineer there. What excites you about what you're doing there? Is it, again, about the accessibility? Because I know, you know, Bigfoot is not yet to market, but people are very excited about it. Yeah, uh, accessibility uh, is one of the, the large parts and reliability. Going through the DIY stuff. It's happening at an incredible pace. Change is is happening there, and things break. Things don't always go the way that you intended. There has to be a balance there somewhere. Well, you have to have services. I mean, look at what happened recently with server outages in different companies. You have to be prepared for how am I going to support this? How am I going to keep it running? You know, whatever it is, it's that the reliability of, of we're all we're all human. It's humans behind the the scenes uh, making the the changes and the improvements that we rely on. So how do we do that as safely and effectively as possible to minimize the impact and continue to increase the value to the the user? This might be a very dumb question, but Kevin, let me ask you. Melissa mentioned the the new software that we're using, and she's talking about Control IQ from Tandem, which is the software that we've got now. And there are other commercial, quote, solutions. There's other commercial systems coming out. When you look back at all the stuff that the DIY community did and is continuing to do, do you feel like you guys really, really pushed it along? I mean, I got to tell you, and I know nothing, and I never even used Night Scout, and people laugh at me, but I think we would never be close to where we are commercially. Does that add up to you? Uh, Yeah, it adds up. It's not for everyone. You know, it is bleeding edge. The, the community. Yeah, in, in a lot of ways, it drives industry. You know, I'm not asking you to say specifically without this, we wouldn't have that. But it just seems to me that we would have gotten there eventually. But I don't know that the people behind Night Scout and, and so much of other, the other things you've mentioned really either got into industry and helped push things along or helped with the FDA. You know, as, a, as kind of an outsider on this, can you speak to whether that's true? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think that that it had to. I mean, that's the nature of of competition. There was an unmet need in the the community, and that unmet need was was fulfilled. Well, what I would say is industry needs to see that something has viability as an Mm -hmm. idea. And so I firmly believe that many of these things were, were floating around in companies as potential developments in their pipelines. Uh, what the community did with our DIY efforts is say, we are so desperate for this thing. We will just build it ourselves if you can't deliver. Mm -hmm. And so I think it helps prioritize. Like I've seen almost every company in the industry actually skip over other things that were in their pipeline to get to these things and reprioritize their own uh, product roadmaps to try to deliver and I don't think it's it's I, it's not in a oh we better get this or the community's going to do it themselves way. It's a 
okay, so this is a real need, and we should mm-hmm. we should focus our resources on this. In a lot of ways, it's a, a, a playground for industry to concepts live and die uh, much more quickly in the DIY community than they, they do, and it allows you to iterate faster and find out what does and, and doesn't work. Open source communities have existed outside of diabetes, obviously. It's a and Throughout the last few decades, we've seen what happens in the open source world actually drive change in the industries to which they're associated. And so I think there are analogies to this in terms of like what happens in the software industry with personal computing, with consumer electronics. So I don't I don't find it at all odd or ridiculous to say that the DIY community in diabetes has actually resulted in change within industry. I mean, if only... If, like you pointed out, so many of those names that we uh, and, you know, we're dropping them because we want to see people recognized for their extraordinary contributions. Right. But all of those people, many of them have gone on to found companies, invent new things, join other companies. What's lovely about open source communities, regardless of field or genre or whatever, is that you see that, you see new people roll in with new ideas and lay new work on the foundations of code that were left behind um, and innovate and continue to innovate. And so we will see the DIY community around forever. They will continue to innovate. And we will also see many of those innovators move on into the industries, you know, in which they're working. That is a personal choice that they they have to make and they'll they'll go through the the same decisions that that we did. And not everybody will. I mean, Dana Lewis is not associated with a company. Well, I'm not saying that that's an inevitability, right? Right, but, of course. Um, but it's pretty common. You have to be pretty geeky probably to, to know of other open source communities <laughs> open to diabetes. Um, and I'm, you know, Kevin is way more well-versed to speak about that. But it is the way of things. Before I let you go, this all started because you wanted to have kids, right? This, this is the timeline that you set out for me way at the beginning here. And your kids now, they're both in grade school. Uh, your daughter's 10. Your son is 8. I'm curious, Melissa, yes. do they know their part in this story? Because it's not an exaggeration to say, and I'll say it for you, it's not an exaggeration to say that you wanting to have kids sparked action in Kevin that, frankly, has helped thousands of people. I know you're, you didn't do it alone. I know, I know, I know. But do your kids know the part that they played? To a degree. Like, they know that we help people with diabetes and they take that really seriously. As a matter of fact, when I was changing roles from my role at Bigfoot to my role at Tidepool, my daughter's first question was like, but you'll still be helping people with diabetes. Like, will Bigfoot still be able to help people with diabetes? I'm like, yes, it's all, it's all good. We're all good. We're all still helping people with diabetes. And they've grown up with these things in the sense that We love to tell the story of when our son was about three years old and he would hear the Night Scout song that would was basically the alert sound that would play. And he knew that when I was low, there was a bag of sour ball candy on the top shelf of the pantry that came down. So he would hear that sound, that Night Scout song, and that song was sour balls to him. And he would scream, shower balls, shower balls. <laughs> like he was all in, or maybe like two. I mean, he was yeah. little, it was two. Um, and so like it became the shower balls song, right? You know, the other day he heard the Night Scout little song play and he said, mom, who invented that song? And I posted something to Facebook. Uh, well, basically Lane Dusborough invented that song or found um, it. I wrote something about like, I just set my son down. I said, let me tell you the story of our people and how we came to the Valley of Silicon, you know, Uh, which is, of course, not the way I said it to an eight year old, but I'm, you know, amusing myself. But essentially, you know, there are some of these folks that they literally do talk about Uncle Lane and Uncle Manny and Uncle Ben. And like my daughter thinks she has a lot of uncles. Uh, (laughs) But, you know, so they know that we've helped a great many people. And as they as they get older, and we can sort of uh, expound on that, then I think, um, well, let's be honest, they won't care. <laughs> for a while, right? As teenagers, they'll be like, "Will you shut up about DIY?" Oh, diabetes. they'll care. Uh, they just won't let but, you know they care. That's right. So <laughs> some someday uh, they'll appreciate it in a in a different way. But that's what they know now. 
Kevin, you know, you also said this was about your commute, making sure Melissa was safe. Uh, knowing that Melissa is a very strong and independent woman, do you feel like she's safe? Did that check that box for you, all this hard work? Yeah. Absolutely. This is kind of something that she went into earlier, but I I really view the monitoring that I've done and the the work that I've done as really just augmenting and trying to simplify and uh, make her life easier. We first started dating. I actually told her that you will never find somebody work harder at being lazy than, than me. And, you know, that was just a testament of I wanted to automate all the things that are just repetitive and and predictable and uh, easily managed to try to get that out of the way. You know, that that comes from the the background of operations and managing online sites. Being able to uh, automate those those aspects have helped me uh, feel like it's more safe. And then, you know, other times like with, with monitoring, it's it's great to be able to just see that, you know, know she's about to, to go out for a, a walk. And then I happen to look over at Night Scout, see how much insulin she has on board and where she is and say, you you might want to run a, a temp basal. So it's just there to, to try to, to augment and help her navigate it. And so, yeah, it does give me a sense that she's safer because of this. Yeah, I got, I got really mad at him the other day because he was right. I was like, whatever. And I left the house and then I went massively low while I was walking the kids to school. And I was like, yeah, well, fine. Um, so, you know, there's that too, which I'm sure is completely unfamiliar to you as the <laughs> mother of a teenager. That sounds more like my marriage, actually. Diabetes or not. I think that's, just, <laughs> that's just a component of marriage. Damn it. He was right again. Oh, oh well, you know. Thank you so much for spending so much time with me. I love your story. I just think that there are just amazing people that I hate have diabetes, but I'm glad if you had to that you've done so much for so many others who have it as well. And I really appreciate you spending some time to tell us these things from years ago now because they really are important as we move forward. So thanks for being with me. Well, thank you so much for being interested in the story and for helping others hear our crazy (laughs) scheme. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. Much more information at diabetes-connections.com. You can always click on the episode page and find out more. A transcript is there as well. I just adore them. I'm, I, I know the interview went longer than usual, but I, I couldn't help myself. And as I said in, in episode 300, when I looked back on 300 episodes, Melissa really helped change my place in the diabetes community by inviting me to speak at Master Lab in 2015. That really did change how I felt about where I wanted to be, uh, helped me find and focus my voice. I, I really can't overstate that enough. So thanks, Melissa, for doing that. And again, lots of information went by very quickly, lots of name dropping there in a good way. Um, And I promise I will keep on the Night Scout crew. I may ask some of you as you listen to lean on your friends. I'm not going to mention any names here. Uh, But people that I have reached out to, and they're the usual suspects, if you search We Are Not Waiting or Night Scout on the website, you'll see some big omissions. So I'll talk more about that on social media. We'll get them. As a community, maybe it's just me, you know, who's, who's fascinated by this, but I do think it's a very important part of our history that we need to document. Because in a few more years, many of the solutions that people like Kevin were working on are going to be all commercial and all FDA approved. And isn't that wonderful? But I don't want to forget what happened. And I think it'll be great to look back. Okay, enough about that. I got Tell Me Something Good coming up in just a moment. And then stay tuned later on. I'm going to tell you another change we made to how we use Control IQ with Benny. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. And it is really hard to think of something that has changed our diabetes management as much as the Dexcom share and follow apps. I mean, what really amazed me, we started it when Benny was about nine years old, the Dexcom, and we got share a little less than two years later. And the most immediate change was how it helped us talk less about diabetes. And boy, did that come just in time for us, because that's the wonderful thing about share and follow. As a caregiver, parent, spouse, whatever, you can help the person with diabetes manage in the way that works for your individual situation. And going into those tween and teen years, It sounds counterintuitive, but being able to talk about diabetes less, what's your number? Did you check? What's your number? You know, is so helpful. Internet connectivity is required to access Dexcom Follow. Separate follow app required. Learn more. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. (music) 
I am cheating a little bit this week for Tell Me Something Good because while I usually read you listener submissions, I saw this on Beyond Type 1's Facebook page and I just had to share. They did a whole post about people with Type 1 getting married and they wanted to hear the wedding stories. So they started out with, hey, a big congrats, by the way, to Kelsey, her husband, Derek, and this adorable picture of them. They're both low at their wedding and they're sipping some juice boxes. And Kelsey is part of the Beyond Type 1 Leadership Council. So congratulations to you both. It's a really adorable picture. I'm going to link up the whole Facebook thread because people share stories like, you know, I had my pump tucked into my bra and I didn't think I'd need it during the wedding or I was a bridesmaid and I had it there and I had to reach in. Um, You know, other people who went low trying on wedding dresses. I mean, I remember this. So this person writes, I went low in David's bridal trying on wedding dresses. It's a lot more physical than you think getting in and out of dresses and slips, hot lights, and just emotions. My mom had to run across the street and grab a Snickers. I was standing in the doorway of the fitting room and inhaling a Snickers, praying I didn't get any on the clothes, which just added an extra level of stress. I remember apologizing to the employee helping me, and he was like, I don't even worry about it. And he stayed with me to make sure I was okay. Another woman writes, my mom came up to me right before we were set to walk into the reception. She told me she had hidden a juice under our sweetheart table in case I went low. I've been diabetic 30 years and my mom still carries snacks for me in her purse. Sure enough, right after dinner, I ended up needing it. And the last one here, being excited, nervous, and unable to sit still. I did a long and intense bike ride prior to my evening wedding. Luckily, we had a chocolate fountain at our reception and I spent a large chunk of the night at or near it. And this goes on and on. So what a wonderful thread. Congratulations to everybody who is talking about their weddings and their their wonderful stories of support. And the humor that's on display here is amazing. So I will link that up. You can go and read. There's there's dozens of comments. If you've got a story like this, hey, that's what Tell Me Something Good is for. Send me your your stories, your milestones, your diversaries, your good stuff. You know, anything from the healthcare heroes in our community to a kid who put his first inset in to a person celebrating 70 years with type one. I post on social media, just look for those threads, or you can always email me, stacy at diabetes-connections.com. Before I let you go, I had promised to share the other change we made to Control IQ, in addition to eliminating the long-acting basil that we had used, you know, untethered for almost two years. We decided recently to completely turn off sleep mode. I know a lot of you enjoy sleep mode 24-7. As we said back in our episode, um, gosh, in late December, when uh, Control IQ was approved, in the studies they called you folks sleeping beauties because you enjoy that 24-7 sleep mode. But I found that since school has ended and you know, we're trying to figure out what to do with Benny for the summer, there is nothing really that's keeping him on a regular sleep schedule. And it's gotten to the point where he is now so nocturnal. And I'm hearing this about a lot of my friends with teenagers. Maybe I sound like a terrible parent. He's going to bed at like four or five, six o'clock in the morning. I walked into his room at eight o'clock in the morning the other day. I wanted to ask him a question. I was like, oh, I got to wake him up. And he was awake. He hadn't gone to sleep yet. You know, it boggles my mind. It's all topsy-turvy. And we'll get back into a routine at some point, but I'm not really willing to make a big fuss about it. He's, he is keeping busy overnight. I guess his friends are up. I don't know. But anyway, the point is he's eating at really weird hours. And when he was in sleep mode, we noticed that it wasn't helping as much, right? Because it doesn't bolus you in sleep mode. It only adjusts basal. So if he under bolused for his, you know, pad tie at two in the morning, it wasn't helping out. And true story, I asked him about that. Like, what's this line? And what happened overnight here? Were you sleeping? He's like, no, I was in the kitchen eating the leftover Thai food. <laughs> so we decided that his numbers during the, the quote day when he was sleeping were hovering right around 90. I mean, maybe 110. I mean, it was very in range, right? No need to mess with that. So I didn't think we needed to add sleep mode. And I didn't want to predict when he would actually be sleeping. So we just turned it off. And that has made a big difference too. So I guess the bottom line is figure out what works for you, for your individual situation, the weirdo wacko situation, if it's us, but, you know, use this technology to benefit you, whatever way that is. If it's sleep mode right now, 24 seven, if it's no sleep mode, if it's exercise mode all the time, And it'll be so fascinating to see, and this all ties back into the DIY movement, right? It'll be great to see the flexibility that we will get in the next couple of years. Because, you know, Medtronic had a higher target range because they were first with the the hybrid closed loop. Tandem has a lower one. Omnipod will have a more flexible target. You can set your own target when they come out with Horizon. And of course, Tandem and everybody else is going to be moving to that direction as well. 
and it just keeps getting better. But it gets better because people like Melissa and Kevin Lee pushed and pushed. And without these folks, and there's so many of them, of course, right, who said we can do it better, we would not be where we are. I, I truly believe the technology companies would be five or six years behind. And if you're new to the show and new to the community and you're excited about, you know, Control IQ or Horizon or whatever you're using, or maybe you're using, um, you know, Loop uh, off-label with Omnipod, I would urge you to go back and check out our earlier episodes from 2015 and 2016 and learn about the really early days of the community. Obviously, by 2015, we're talking about things that happened in the early 2000s. You know, I, I don't want you to misunderstand that it had happened in 2015, but you know what I mean. Okay. Obligatory book commercial. I mean, if you've listened this long, you, maybe you own a copy of The World's Worst Diabetes Mom. If you own it and love it, do me a favor, post about it. The best way, word of mouth about the podcast and the book is always, if you could tell a friend, uh, post in a diabetes group, post on your own Facebook page. You know, I love this book. It's on Amazon. Highly recommend it. If you've read it and you don't like it, forget that you know me. You know, just recycle the book. It's all good. <laughs> Thanks as always to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. And thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here next week. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.